you know, everybody worships. If you think about it, that, that is true. Everybody worships. They may not worship in the way that you and I worship. They might not gather on a Sunday morning and sing songs and listen to preaching or go to a, a life group or study the scripture, but everybody worships. Because Louis Giglio says that the, the definition, the simplest definition of worship is our response to whatever you value the most. So whatever you value, that is what or that is who you are going to worship. So, so whatever you're, you're, you're pa most passionate about, that is what you worship. Whatever you value the most, whatever you place the greatest value on in your life, that is what you worship. But the good news of that is, that means that, that when we worship, that that worship can be contagious, that it can spread. Because think about the things that you value. When you value something, what do you do? You talk about it, right? You, you speak about it. Why? Because it's important to you. You value it. When you value something, when you speak about it, what happens? You know, you get that little, little gleam in your eye. There's a little extra energy, a little extra step little spring in your step because you're talking about something that you value that's important to you. And when you value something, you invite others to kind of come along, right? When, when you're excited about something, when you love something, then you, have, you invite other people to come along for the journey. So think about that as, as followers of Jesus, as people who have said our greatest value, the, the person that we treasure the most is Jesus, the, the one true God then who should we be talking about, right? Jesus, right? Who, who should kind of give that little spark in our eye when we talk about him is, is Jesus. Who should we be inviting to come alongside of us and, and abandon those useless things that we value and worship and worship and value the one that, that really does matter, and that is Jesus. In other words, our worship can become contagious. What if, I mean, just imagine, what if when, when we worship together that people begin to, to stand up and kind of take notice and wonder, what, what, is, what is happening over there? Or what if when we worship, then it really does inspire people to think about and reflect on the goodness and the greatness of God? Right? What if when we worship, it really does become contagious? Well, today we're going to be in, in Nehemiah chapter 12, and there's going to be a huge worship service, a huge worship service as they, as they dedicate the wall, as they acknowledge God's goodness and greatness in their lives, as he helped them to, to rebuild this wall, we're going to see that their worship actually becomes contagious. So beginning in Nehemiah 12, we'll start in verse 27, but kind of the first thing that's going to jump out to us about contagious worship is that worship that is contagious comes from gratitude. Verse 27 of Nehemiah 12 says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing, with cymbals, with harps, and liars. I love that picture. It talks about they're, they're celebrating. As they're dedicating the wall, they're celebrating with, with gladness and with thanksgiving. They're using symbols, which if you read about symbols in Psalm 150, it, it talks about a loud clashing symbol. It talks about sounding symbols, right? Now, Maddie did a great job on the cajon today, right? But, but Nehemiah would be saying, give me some symbol, right? Give me some loud clashing symbol. Say worship with, with cymbals and with harps and with lyres. A lyre was a, a stringed instrument where the person would, would use a pick to play it. And it, it's known for having a, a long range of musical notes. Many scholars think that the, the closest thing we have to an ancient lyre would be an electric guitar. Right? So they use cymbals and lyres and harps and, and singers and different kinds of, of, of musicians but the truth is, that's really not what was significant. He's describing what they used because that was the common, you know, instruments of the day. And choirs were the common way for people to gather and sing in the day. But it's not really that important how they worshipped. But what matters is why they worshipped. 
And in a word, the why behind their worship, the why they were worshiping the one true God was gratitude. Again, in verse 27, it says, celebrate the dedication with gladness and thanksgivings. You see, their worship sprung out of grateful hearts. These are people who, who they and their, their fathers before them had been in exile for over a hundred years. And they had seen as, as they came back and, and with Ezra's leadership, they were able to, to rebuild the temple. And now under Nehemiah, they've been able to rebuild the wall. And their, their hearts have been renewed as they've got this new enthusiasm for listening to and hearing and obeying the scriptures, God's word. So they are filled with gratitude, and they are ready to, and they do express that gratitude in this worship service that they have here in Nehemiah chapter 12. So the, the, the next time, you know, the next time we're tempted to, to go home and kind of critique and evaluate our, our worship experience, right? And sometimes we'll say, you know, the music, it was too soft, or, or it was too loud, or it was too slow, or it was too fast, or the, the music set was too long, or I wish, they would have, I wish the music set was shorter. Or maybe if we're evaluating the preacher and we're thinking, you know, the, the preacher just wasn't funny, or the preacher wasn't as funny as he thought he was, or he, he what? He, or he preaches too sh he preaches too short or he preaches too long or I wish he would preach you know on this topic or this subject or we evaluate the the lighting or the the smell in the room or the bathrooms weren't clean enough whatever it is and just to be clear we should we should evaluate every one of those things because we should do absolutely everything that we do when we're doing it for the Lord we should do it with excellence but what if what if before we even thought about critiquing and evaluating all of those things what if we said let me examine my heart was my heart flowing out of a heart of gratitude did I enter into the worship service with thanksgiving with gratitude because that that's what that's what stimulated worship in Nehemiah chapter 12 there were great musicians there and there was a crowd of people there but what made the worship vibrant what made it contagious was that it was flowing out of a grateful heart. So contagious worship comes from gratitude, but also contagious worship does take preparation. Look at verses 28 through 30. Nehemiah chapter 12, 28 says, And the sons of the singers gathered together from the distri district surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netopathites, also from Beth Gilgal, and from the region of Geba and Asmatheth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. So you, you can tell by the sound of that that this, this worship service they're having and the dedication of the wall, yes, it took great preparation, right? It took planning. It took proclamation they had to get the word out that this was going to take place they had to make sure people were aware of what was happening they had, a, they had to assemble people and figure out where people were going to stand and where they were going to go they had to have rehearsals i mean there's musicians involved you'll see later there's a there's a parade involved so it took a lot of planning and preparation but the truth of that all of that is is yes essential and it couldn't have happened without all of that preparation right but without something else happening there, there's no guarantee that any worship was going to take place it would be as if it would be as if you were going to start a fire and, and for preparation of that fire you, you took kindling and you kind of made a, a little pyramid with it out of the smaller stuff and and you had it just right and you knew you had the wood that would that would easily catch on fire but until there's fire, right, all of that preparation is for, for naught. At some point, you've got to have a spark, right? At some point, you've got to have a flame that catches all of the preparation on fire. So, yeah, the preparation, all that they did was essential, but it, it wasn't comprehensive. It wasn't everything. And then in verse 30 tells us the even more significant part of their preparation for this worship. Because it says, and the priests... And the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. So even more important than all of the logistical 
preparation that went into this event was the spiritual prep preparation. They wanted to make sure that the, that the wood wasn't wet, that it really was you know, ready to be caught on fire. So imagine for us if prior to worship, if we paid as much attention to, to spiritual preparation as we do all of the other preparation and getting ready and getting kids ready and all of that, if we spent as much energy and effort preparing our hearts for worship Imagine if we came to worship and we, we've confessed our sins. We've asked God to, to seek our heart and show me if there's any, any sinful way in me. Right? If we've said, God, show me. Let me see my life and my sin the same way that you do. Imagine if we've spent time and energy and effort and thought, are there, are there broken relationships in my life? Am I coming into this worship experience knowing that, that there's people who are angry, who I haven't made an attempt to, to reconcile and to make peace with? Have I spent time before I came to worship just dwelling on, thinking about, reflecting on the goodness and the greatness of God? Have I, have I surrendered my agenda, right? Am I coming in saying, God, I don't have an agenda here. What is it that you have in store? What is it that you want to show me? What is it that you want to change about my life? Because, God, I'm, I'm coming into this worship experience with, with my hands wide open. I simply want to receive what it is that you have for me as we worship you this morning. So the reason that their worship was contagious, and we'll see in just a little while how contagious it was, was because they were prepared, but not just logistically, but they were spiritually prepared to worship the Lord. The other thing in this passage that kind of jumps out at us is that worship that is contagious is joyful. Look at verses 31 through 43. He says, Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate, and after them, Hoshiah and the half of the leaders of Judah and Ezariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priests' sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zechur, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Ezrael, Maliah, Gilali, Maya, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. At the fountain gate they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David, at the ascent of the wall, above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall, above the tower to the ovens, to the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, and the gate of Yeshanah, and by the fish gate, and by the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, and the priests, Elikim, Messiah, Meninim, Micaiah, Elani, Zechariah, and Hananiah, with trumpets, and Messiah, Shimamai, Eleazar, Uzai, Jehonanon, Malkajah, Elam, and Ezer. And the singers sang with Jezariah as their leader. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. So verse 31 again says, Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. And when you read this, you kind of think about Tobiah. If you remember Tobiah from earlier, he was one of the naysayers. He was one of the guys that was trying to, to stop the building of the wall. And in Nehemiah 4.3, it says, Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So if you, you wonder if Tobiah is in eyesight, and we know he's still there, as we'll see later on in the, in the scripture, probably next week. But as he's as he's looking and seeing that up on top of the wall is not a fox, but, but it's many of the leaders, the, the government officials, the Levites, the priests, two great choirs all standing on 
the wall, much more significant than a fox, and yet there it stands. In verse 31, 38, and 40, it describes choirs. Literally, the word there for choirs is thanks. Most translations translate, you know, choirs that gave thanks. But these were specific thanksgiving choirs. They understood their role. Their role was not to, to be entertainers. Their role was to, to lead the people in expressing thanks and expressing gratitude to God. Verse 35 and others describe the, the trumpets. In verse 36, the orchestra, different instruments. And it says one choir traveled south and the other traveled north. And so you've, you've got these parades of people making their way to the temple. And I love there where it says, and they played the instruments of David. Can you imagine just what a, what a thrill that would be for these musicians to know that they are holding, they are playing one of the instruments that if David himself didn't make it, he commissioned it to be made, right? An instrument that would be over 500 years old at that point, and yet they're using that same instrument in the worship of God. And all along the way, you can see in this, this procession that they'd be stopping at these different gates and the different walls. And you can just imagine the, the memories that were coming to them as they're thinking, yeah, I remember. Remember that big stone there? It took like four of us to, to move it over there. You, you remember when we got here and we were about a third done and it collapsed and we were frustrated, but we said, you know what, we're going to carry on. So we rebuilt the wall. So they're parading through the city and they're just remembering and reminiscing all that God had done through them and the rebuilding of this wall. And then in verse 40, they all converge. They all arrive at the temple. And then verse, verse 43, we're over five times. He's going to use the word joy or rejoice. Verse 43 says, And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. So over five times in, the, in this, this ceremony where they're expressing thanksgiving and they're rededicating themselves and they're recognizing that, yes, Jerusalem, this city belongs to God. God's name will be known throughout Jerusalem and outside of Jerusalem. People will know about the name of God because of what's happening in Jerusalem. Right, people in Jerusalem are people that are following the Lord. People are worshiping the Lord in the city of Jerusalem. So was it orderly? Yes, absolutely. Right, the, the town leaders were in the parade, and, and Ezra led one parade, and Nehemiah followed in one parade. There were priests and Levites in each one. There were worship leaders in each one. It's almost a picture of them spreading out almost symmetrically throughout the city until they arrived all together at the temple. So all of the preparation and planning and gathering and rehearsal and all of the spiritual preparation, it, it didn't lead to a stoic response, right? It, it didn't lead to a quiet, somber response. It led to a response that was full of joy, that was full of rejoicing, Again, they rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. And you wonder how the, the joy, how the rejoicing could be heard far away from Jerusalem. And part of that, yes, has to do with the planning and preparation because they, they, they assembled at the temple, right, which would be on a mountain, the highest part of the city. And then they're standing on the wall. So part of their preparation was to make sure that it was contagious, to make sure that the word got out. But I think that the bigger part of that is, is it got so far out because it was contagious, because it wasn't just people, you know, watching the show of the, of the choirs and the, the people on the wall, you know, speaking and singing. But the picture is people gathered from all over Israel into Jerusalem on this day. And those Thanksgiving choirs led them in singing, led them to sing, to sing along with the choirs. They led them not to just observe and to watch, but to be participants in the worship. So contagious worship is worship that's full of joy. It's not somber, stoic people watching something happening on a stage. It's people, yes, on a stage, but leading other people to gather together and to be able to worship and sing and speak and talk about God's goodness. 
You see, worship was contagious that day because it was joyful. It was full of joy. And because of that, everybody gathered around and worshiped together. So what, what is joy? Joy was, it was the celebration of what God had done for them, right? That the wall had been completed because of God's goodness among them, right? That they had been able to work together to complete this, that now their relationship with God, which was broken for, for hundreds of years throughout their families, is now restored because they've got this renewed passion and love for God's word. Worship that day was contagious because of the joy it contained, right? That, that much joy could not be contained. Now, undoubtedly, Nehemiah, because he had been in the, the palace of Artaxerxes, he had probably seen productions that were more impressive, right? He had probably seen more impressive concerts and, and choirs, right? He had probably seen much grander things done. But the object of their worship couldn't compare because now they were worshiping not an emperor or not some god that the emperor had decided was a god, but now they're worshiping the one true God who they've seen at work in their midst over the last, you know, several years as they've rebuilt the temple and now the wall. So they are worshiping the one true God and it is filling their hearts with joy. You ask yourself the question sometimes, well, what if, you know, I'm just kind of a melancholy person. What if I'm just not that vocal? I just, I struggle sometimes to, to express joy like that. You know, what do you do in a circumstance like that? I, I read an, an article last week by John Piper, who's a, who's, a, who's a person I respect on this particular subject, many subjects, but this one, because John Piper, if, if you hear him speak or talk, is full of, of, of joy and passion and energy. But John Piper is also a very melancholy, analytical type of guy. Right, so, so you know that there's something going on there. So he wrote an article entitled, What About When Joy Is Not Expressed? In other words, what do you do when, I know there's joy in my heart, I, I, I love God, but it's not expressive. What do you do about that? Well, the first thing he said is, is recognize the problem, right? That is a problem because joy is meant to be expressed. It's meant to be verbalized. If it's going to be contagious, then it's got to be spoken. So Matthew, Matthew 12, 34 says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when your heart is full of joy, at some point that joy needs to be expressed. It needs to be spoken verbally. So John Piper says, recognize the problem. Right? He also says, examine yourself. And he gives a series of questions. One, do, do you love Jesus, right? Is, is he really is, if worship is our response to what is most valuable to us, is, is Jesus really what's most valuable to you? Do you love him? Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, Jesus isn't saying don't love your mom and dad or don't love your kids. What he's saying is what is of greatest value. You don't worship your mother and father. You don't worship your children. They don't, they, they're not the most valuable thing. Jesus is the most valuable thing. So ask yourself that question. Is he? Is there something more valuable in my life than Jesus? He goes on to say, do you delight in God? Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So you, do you rejoice? Do you find your happiness? Do you find your joy in your relationship with God? Or are you trying to, to substitute that with something artificial or less significant than your relationship with God? He asks the question, do you fear him? Proverbs 28, 14 says, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall in to calamity. So do you fear him? In other words, do you, do you have a reverence for God? Have you taken who God is too lightly in your life? Or do you have a genuine awe, reverence, fear of God? He asks the question, do you treasure him? Matthew 13, 44 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So if Jesus is what's most valuable to you, then what aren't you willing to give up in order to pursue Jesus? John Piper saying, evaluate that. Do you really treasure him? And he says, discern if, the, if, there's, if there's sin in your heart. 
and he tells a story which I thought was very transparent and, 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 and open. He says it used to be he'd be in a worship service and he would see a person just kind of lightly kind of lift their palms to heaven as if to say, God, whatever, whatever you want me to receive, I'm willing to receive it. And he said that used to anger him. And he wasn't even sure why, but something inside of him would become mad about that. And he began to realize, that's, that's a sin inside of me. That is a me problem. And began to confess that and say, God, I know this is, this is wrong. This is wicked. This is sinful. Why am I judgmental? Why am I trying to judge the motives of another person? So evaluate yourself and say, is, is there something inside of you that, that makes it difficult to express joy? And then he gives some, some passages that you can memorize to help express that joy. You may want to jot these down. Psalm 18.1 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Psalm 42, 1 through 2 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come up and appear before God? Psalm 63.1 says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And then Psalm 73, 25 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And then he says, spend time with, with expressive saints. In other words, if, if your weakness is expressing your love and your joy and your passion for God, then spend time with people who that's not their weakness. That's their, their strength. And let that be contagious. Let that rub off on you, right? Set your heart on heaven. 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. In other words, don't just think about the things of this world, but, but just let your imagination go to what is next, to eternity, and say, in light of that, how do I need to be living my life now, knowing that this is all preparation for ultimately an eternity with God? And then finally he says, raise your expectations. Psalm 42 and 3 says, He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set me upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in God. So ask God, say, God, my, my, my song, whatever song that was, it, it's grown cold. God, put a new song in my mouth. Put a vibrant song in my, li my life. Psalm 51:15 says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. What a great prayer. So if you feel like there, there's joy in your heart, but somehow it's hard to express, like the psalmist pray and say, Oh Lord, you open, my, you open my lips. Let my mouth declare your praise. So worship that is contagious is worship that's full of joy. And that joy at some point has to be expressed in order to be contagious. Worship that is contagious is also generous. Look at verses 44 through 47. It says, On that day when men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes, to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the town, for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God and the service of purification as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel, in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of Aaron." So how do you know when, when, you're, when you're worshiping, when you're rejoicing? Is, is that worship or am I just emotional? Is that emotionalism or where, the, where the rubber meets the road as you worship? Right? Does it lead to giving? Does it lead to sacrifice? Does it lead to, okay, God, you are worthy of this. So, so it belongs to you. All of this belongs to you. You know, what is your willingness to give, to sacrifice? Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart 
will also be. Right? Sometimes as part of worship, we'll, we'll raise our hands, and what does that remind you of? Right? If you've watched cops, that's surrender. Right? That's okay, you're, you're in charge, I'm not in charge. Right? Well, it's the same thing when, when we worship, we're saying, God, I, I surrender. Well, everything that I have belongs to you, so I'm willing to give, I'm willing to be generous. And you wonder, well, how does, how, what does generosity have to do with worship being contagious? And I think g- generosity is just, just one example of a changed life. It's just one evidence that God's got a hold of our heart. But the, but the point is, if we're worshiping God and we're expressing that, and people know there's a person who worships God, there's a person who their highest value in life is their, their relationship with Jesus, then that person's going to expect that your life will have been changed, that it will be different, that it won't be the same. So yes, through giving and through sacrifices, but through any other number of ways that God has changed our heart. People should be able to look at that and go, yes, I I don't understand it all, and I don't know it all, but I know that's a person who worships Jesus, and look at their life. It's different. It's changed. They're full of hope. They're not full of despair. They're not cowering in fear like the, the rest of the world tends to be, but somehow there's a courageous, joyful hope about them. Their lives have been changed. And suddenly people will be drawn to that. People will want to know, well, does that mean if, if, if I worship, if I say, yes, I want to make Jesus the highest value in my life, can my life be changed too? Can my life be transformed? So when our lives are transformed by worship, then that worship becomes contagious. So if we want contagious worship, worship that points people to Jesus, gives people a, the desire in their heart to know him, to have a relationship with him, then yeah, that flows out of a grateful heart, a heart that is reflecting on God's goodness. It also involves preparation, but not just logistically, but preparation of our heart to worship as we evaluate and ponder and ask God to search our heart. Right, worship that is contagious is joyful. It's expressed. Right? It's one thing, as, as, as Mary did, to ponder these things in your heart. But at some point, those things, those things that you're rejoicing on, have to come out as a witness to others to the goodness of God. And then finally, worship that is contagious is worship that is generous because that's an evidence that our lives have been transformed. That it's not just an emotional reaction, but it truly is our life's response to the most significant person in our life whose name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that that we can know you, and because we can know you, we can worship you. And God, you made that way possible. God, we acknowledge that because of your holiness and your greatness, God, your majesty, that would be too much for us to even take in. And yet, You paved a way for us. You sent your son, Jesus. And because of that, we can know you. We can have a relationship with you. God, our lives can be changed. We can rejoice. We can worship you. We can allow allow your presence to change, to transform our hearts. So God, I pray this morning, God, as as the gathered saints here at Northwoods, as we gather to, to worship you and acknowledge your significance in our lives, God, that you would make that contagious. God, we, we want to we do what we can do. We want to prepare, but we know ultimately, God, it's you're the one that will make that contagious. It's your Holy Spirit that will plant that desire on the hearts of others. So we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen.